Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining me and Anna uh, today. So today we have a very interesting um, webinar and, uh, and a very uh, exciting guest. So her name is Anna Popenka. And uh, uh, Anna is uh, head of microbiome analytics at Atlas Biomed. Um, today with Anna, um, we're going to talk about what well, she's going to she's going to talk about um, various um, methods of identifying bacterial communities. Um, she's going to give us um, a really nice sort of overview of various, various methods that we use historically. What do we use now? She's going to talk about the amplicon sequencing, whole genome sequencing, and lots of uh, interesting uh, details about, about that. So um, without further ado, I would like to introduce you, Anna Papienko. Hi, Anna. Uh, hi, Lisa. Nice to meet you there. Uh, thank you for inviting. Uh, so, um, my name is Anna, and uh, I did microbiome research for over 10 years. Uh, I have a PhD in bioinformatics, and my thesis uh, was devoted to uh, human microbiome as well. Uh, so, uh, let me start with my uh, presentation. Just a moment. Uh, here's it. Uh, can you see uh, the slide? Okay. Yes, yes, that's perfect. Mm -hmm. So to start with, um, uh, what is microbiome? Uh, microbiome is actually in, uh, any bacterial, viral, fungal community or uh, well, community of micro uh, microorganisms living in a particular uh, ecological niche. So it can be sea, it can be just some pool or even cheese, and of course, gut and human gut. Uh, the most uh, various, the most abundant uh, microbial community in the human body is uh, a gut microbiome. So it takes up to a trillion uh, cells inside it. Mm -hmm. How can I? Oh. I think if you just go like press on the arrows, it will, it will work. Yeah. Uh, well, um, humans uh, knew for a long time that there are some other invaders inside us, uh, even, even before the sequencing era. Uh, how did they discover this? Uh, mostly by the uh, microbiological cultures methods. Um, these methods uh, uh, consist in the following. So, um, you take a sample, for example, thesis sample, and you try to grow up cells that, uh, uh, well, bacterial cells that live in there on a uh, specific uh, substrate. Um, and that is how actually uh, we all discovered that, yes, something is growing inside us. Uh, but there is uh, uh, quite a um, uh, limitation consisting in the following. Uh, so not all the bacteria uh, in the human microbiome can uh, grow up on a culture, even in anaerobic culture, which is like liquid. Because uh, the community inside us, is not like a soap with the bacteria, but it's a very much constructed community with uh, trophic connections, uh, which cannot be uh, interfered uh, which uh, if and if they're if uh, they're broken uh, all their like connecting bacteria cannot grow so uh, only a small part of bacteria can be grow uh, on uh, on the culture uh, the second method probably um, very common to you is a pcr analysis uh, it does not have this limitation. Uh, during PCR, you do not have to grow up your bacteria, but PCR is done uh, only for a particular target. So you should know uh, which bacteria you're trying to catch up with the PCR. Uh, you cannot get the full community only by PCR. So um, the new era in microbiome research started with the uh, next generation sequencing. NGS uh, machines uh, are doing the following thing. 
you take the sample, you take uh, all the DNA from the sample, and you get, get the sequencing um, of this DNA. Uh, thus, it, it is not dependent on growing something or having particular targets. You can see the whole diversity. Uh, one of the, uh, let's say, um, like very powerful researchers uh, that started the microbiome research era was done in uh, 2003 um, by uh, Craig Venter, who just rented um, um, a ship, um, got a sequencing machine on this, and uh, he just uh, traveled across the uh, Sea collecting uh, sea microbiome samples and sequencing them right on the ship. It's like, a, I think it, it's a dream job for a scientist. Uh, so it is the first massive microbiome research. And since then, uh, scientists uh, started to sequence uh, microbiomes from all over the world, from all over the places, uh, like uh, also uh, different seas, uh, soils, uh, oils, uh, and of course, uh, human body. Uh, but um, here I have to mention that there are two major strategies in sequencing microbiome. Uh, the first one, also used by Atlas Biomed, is amplicon sequencing. Uh, is, uh, amplicon sequencing uh, is strictly not a metagenomic sequencing, uh, because uh, here we get not the full DNA, but just a particular part uh, of the DNA called 16S rRNA gene. Uh, this gene is present in bacteria and archaea. Uh, that is why the first and very important limitation is that we cannot see uh, fungi uh, and uh, different eukaryotes, parasites, by this method, only bacteria and archaea. So uh, from the sample, for example, fecal sample, uh, we extract uh, uh, only uh, this uh, 16 s RNA gene sequencing, not the whole DNA. Uh, we just uh, uh, amplified it uh, by PCR and then sequence. Why this gene? Uh, 16S RNA gene has a very uh, specific structure. It is composed of uh, so-called conservative and variative regions. Uh, what are they? Uh, conservative uh, regions uh, are those regions that have a stable sequence uh, common for all the species, genera, and so on. And so it is all the same uh, among different taxonomical uh, units. And variative regions are actually variative between different species. And the more they are variative, the more distinct are the species. That is why by comparing um, the um, percent of uh, variation in those uh, variative uh, regions, we can predict uh, how far the species are from each other uh, or close to some known taxonomical uses and thus identify uh, the bacteria and archaea. So uh, in Atlas particularly, we use sequencing of V4 um, uh, variative region. And uh, uh, that is why we're able to identify uh, which bacteria we see. Uh, there's uh, also one more limitation in this particular method, uh, um, which is um, connected with reconstruction, uh, re reconstructing uh, metabolism. So we can see only these genes and not any other. So we, ca we cannot see uh, metabolic pathways of uh, whatever directly, but uh, we can reconstruct like, okay, we see the 16S RNA. Uh, it is, uh, well, it looks like it came from Escherichia coli, for example. Yeah. And we know the genome of Escherichia coli. We know uh, which metabolism it has. And that is why we can reconstruct, uh -huh, we can see a taxonomical unit like this. Uh, it has genome uh, like this. So we predict that it has uh, this uh, metabolic capabilities like synthetizing uh, particular vitamins, producing um, a CFA like butyrate, uh, producing whatever. Uh, 
um, so but uh, we cannot uh, uh, talk about those uh, functions, uh, metabolic pathways, which are uh, transferred horizontally. Bacteria uh, are able of uh, sharing uh, plasmids, specific circular DNA, uh, which uh, might encode uh, some functions. For example, antibiotic resistance is the most common. And they, they are not transferred to like um, vertically from mother to child, but horizontally between uh, different cells, they just uh, uh, push uh, out their plasmids into the like, environment and some other bacteria catch it and huh, it's about resistance. I want uh, this feature. Yes, and that is how uh, they share because it is not connected to taxonomy. That is why we uh, cannot predict this. And uh, uh, well, but uh, uh, the very good thing about applicant secrecy is that it is uh, rather fast and cheap. So that is uh, uh, why it is one of the most common ways of uh, analyzing microbiome currently. But it is not the only way. Uh, so the true metagenomic sequencing uh, includes uh, sequencing not only those 16 s RNA, but uh, the complete uh, DNA from the sample. That is why by metagenomic sequencing, we can see not only bacteria and here, but also fungi, viruses, phages, um, eukaryotic parasites, and so on. Uh, so uh, the pipeline actually uh, similar. Uh, we uh, extract DNA from the uh, sample, like faces sample also, uh, cut it into pieces, into short pieces, and then we sequence these pieces. Uh, after that, uh, uh, the analysis done is uh, separated into well, some uh, major parts like taxonomy, uh, taxonomic profiling. Uh, we search by uh, comparing uh, the obtained sequencing with some reference data set. Like, mm, we see this uh, part looks like, uh, uh, I don't know, Salmonella enterica. Okay, we say that Salmonella enterica is present. Uh, then uh, we count in percents uh, each uh, uh, taxonomy uh, unit found. And thus we get uh, the uh, whole diversity. And um, also the second important part is functional profiling, uh, like saying not only uh, that this sequence came from uh, some particular uh, microorganism, but also it came from a particular gene. And that is why uh, we say that this gene uh, and uh, this function is present. And we uh, profile, we can profile not only taxonomy, but uh, um, uh, their functional potential. Uh, it is still, it is still potential because uh, uh, here we assume that um, not uh, uh, all the, all those genes which are encoded are actually uh, work. Yeah, um, I'll see. Uh, I'll, show you on the next slide. So uh, we have DNA, RNA, and protein. Uh, DNA is a potential. RNA uh, comes from the uh, um, <clears throat> transcription from DNA uh, and then transformed into protein. And protein is uh, actually something which works, which uh, is like um, uh, what makes the function real. So when we speak about metagenomics, uh, we speak about potential for doing something, but it does not mean that it really happens. Because uh, uh, the uh, um, tra uh, transcription uh, and tra translation and transcription uh, are dependent on conditions. Uh, so in some conditions, uh, this might work. In other conditions, uh, it might not work. Um, and actually, uh, there are studies uh, which use not metagenomic um, techniques, but metatranscriptomic and even metaproteomic. Um, 
Method transcriptome is uh, pretty much, uh, um, well, method transcriptomic study is pretty much uh, similar to metagenomic. So there's also sequencing. And metaproteome is an uh, absolutely different field done by uh, different machines. Uh, and it is very much complicated. Uh, it's still not very popular because of its price and uh, it's very hard to interpret. And also, also there is a meta metabolome. Uh, it's something uh, which is like produced by uh, the work of proteins, like uh, we'll have some protein enzyme, which uh, um, makes uh, one substance out of the uh, other substance. Yeah. And uh, meta metabolome uh, is looking for those substances. Uh, uh, this is also done like uh, by the third category of uh, machines. Uh, it is a quite uh, also complicated story to work with, but still uh, quite an important part. Uh, a couple of words on uh, bioinformatics uh, used for um, major genomics, first of all. Uh, we obtain uh, like uh, gigabytes uh, of data from um, mix sequencing and megabytes uh, from uh, amplicon sequencing. So it's not really yet uh, the real big data, but very closely uh, close to it. Um, and that is why we can uh, use uh, machine learning algorithms uh, for analysis. For example, how it happens. Uh, let's say we get uh, taxonomy uh, data on uh, uh, hundreds of samples, like uh, we know uh, the percent of each uh, taxonomic unit uh, in the sample, uh, in each sample. And also we have some data on phenotype of the samples. For example, uh, the donor of the sample, was he like healthy or uh, did he or she had some kind of uh, illness? Uh, age, um, uh, dietary habits, and so on. All these data we can use. Um, and uh, by uh, using machine learning algorithms, we uh, just combine this data. Uh, we uh, trying to make a classifier saying uh, like uh, which uh, kind of a microbiome overall uh, does one uh, have uh, if uh, he or she has some kind of illness. So uh, we have uh, in our Atlas Biomed chest um, uh, trait called disease protection is uh, built with the machine learning algorithms. And actually what does it show is uh, how is your microbiome uh, similar uh, to an average microbiome of a person with uh, one or another illness. Yes, so that is why we cannot see, uh, we can say it is a risk prediction or anything like this, because uh, here we do not have our particular uh, like consequence uh, connection. So we can say which was the first illness or microbiome. That's why we do not uh, speak about risk. But uh, it says how it's similar right in the moment. And uh, this is uh, uh, quite a perspective um, analytical tool for microbiome, not only uh, consisting of uh, like pretty, um, saying about illnesses, uh, some kind of states, but also um, about uh, dietary habits. Yeah, oh, you have a microbiome over a meat lover. Yeah, something like this. Yeah. Uh, and uh, but still, it is just one of the multiple approaches applicable uh, in uh, various uh, microbiome studies. Um, and uh, same about microbiome studies. Um, there is uh, one last uh, important mentioning. Uh, they're uh, devoted into. Um, well, they're separated uh, into uh, major categories, so uh, like any other biological study, by the way, um, like in vitro and in vivo. Uh, 
in vitro is about growing bacteria on some media uh, or in some artificial um, conditions. Uh, here in the picture, you can see uh, this <laughs> strange uh, black cube machine. Um, you can try guess what is it, but I think you, you won't guess it. So I'll say uh, it is an artificial gut machine. <laughs> yeah, um, it looks uh, really strange. Uh, doesn't look like a gut, but it is. Uh, and it is uh, like a very uh, advanced uh, way of uh, in vitro microbiome studies, uh, very much popular again recently. recently. Uh, but still, uh, the most applicable and used results are made from um, in vivo studies, usually, usually um, modeling um, organisms are used uh, like mice, pigs, um, which are like uh, very <clears throat> easy to cultivate and more or less uh, it can be uh, the knowledge obtained from those animals can be uh, like applicable to humans but yeah with some restrictions um, uh, and uh, the main restriction about these animals is that they have a much uh, shorter gut um, when we speak about uh, gut microbiome, uh, yeah, it's, it's not about all the intestines, uh, it's just about gut. Because uh, in the uh, like higher JT, there are much less bacteria. Yep. Uh, so, um, but there are also uh, studies uh, done on chickens, some uh, ruminal animals, uh, and those um, studies we do not use because these animals have uh, completely uh, different GIT. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I guess <laughs> I've told, um, yeah. Great, very interesting. Thank you very much. So as you were speaking, I was kind of, um, kind of some questions were popping out popping out in my head. So, you know, when you were saying about the 16S RNA, so this is what is used the method in our uh, testing. Now, um, so you mentioned that it's only, uh, it's able to detect bacteria and archaea. Uh, is it because this gene is only present in bacteria or archaea and it's not like in viruses or fungi or, you know, other microorganisms? Yes, yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. It is only uh, present in archaea and bacteria, uh, in uh, uh, like uh, eukaryotes, uh, including fungi. Uh, it is called 18S RNA oh. genes, but it is uh, yeah, different in sequence. So we can't, for example, with this sort of technology, we can't uh, detect this the 18S. Mm. Usually, no. Um, there, well, with this kind of technology, overall technology, uh, uh, yes, uh, actually, uh, um, primers for HNS can be done. Uh, for fungi, uh, they usually use not uh, HNS but ITS. There are some specific uh, fungal regions used for their classification. Uh, mm -hmm. The problem is making a mix of uh, primers for 16S and 18S and IGS and making this all in just one epidermis. Uh, mm -hmm. We try to make this, but it didn't really work out. Interesting. Cool. So is it true that then the whole genome sequencing is the sort of next maybe solution to test other microbes? Yes, sure. Uh, and uh, uh, yes, Chiyoli, uh, it was uh, quite an expensive thing, um, the truly metagenomic sequencing, but it's getting cheaper and cheaper. So, uh, yes, uh, sooner or later we will uh, come up with this technology. <laughs> Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Very cool. Very exciting times ahead. Um, cool. And also, so um, if we use the whole genome sequencing and or versus the um, 16S amplicant, is whole genome more precise uh, in detecting even the bacterial uh, genome or, or it's as precise as 16S? Uh, it uh, can be even more precise because mm -hmm. um, 
you know, it, is, it can be more precise than analyzing one region of 16S as we do now. So uh, if uh, to compare with the whole 16S RNA gene, uh, the precision would be more or less the same, I guess. Uh, but since we analyze only one region, um, which uh, uh, can be, I don't know, which can be um, uh, identical in some very few species, for example, uh, the whole genome sequencing will see the difference and identify uh, two different species. Mm. Yeah, because uh, I think like sometimes um, in, even in our results, you can have two bacteria that are like linked together, like Escherichia and Shigella. And is it because they are 16S is very similar and the technology can't really exactly detect which one it is. Is that correct? Yes, that's true. Uh, so the whole it? genome sequencing can kind of is a solution to actually detect exactly which one it is. Uh, yes, and even more, uh, whole genome sequencing uh, can identify different Escherichia uh, coli um, and separate, uh, for example, um, those pathogenic uh, E. coli from the ordinary ones. Mm -hmm. well, that's, I think that that's where we need like the next sort of answers to some of our questions. That would be really cool. Uh, great. Um, also, uh, you, were men you were talking about measuring um, metabolic pathways. Uh, it, what, is the, what are the methods right now? Or do we have methods um, to measure the metabolic pathways? Uh, yes, uh, we use metabolic reconstruction, as I said, uh, for calculating a potential for vitamin uh, synthesis or uh, butyrate production. And uh, how, well, as I just told, mm, uh, we just uh, identify our taxonomy. We will find the closest known genome and look for uh, genes in those genomes, and we get it. And thus, we um, assume that since uh, the taxonomy is really close, uh, probably they have the uh, same functions inside their genome. And uh, that's why we uh, use the CIPR and predict that, yes, we have uh, a such portion of uh, this metabolic pathway in our mind. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Very interesting, cool. Um, I think. Um, I mean, there was a thing that I, I kind of made a note for myself, the difference between uh, prediction models and risk models. So you said it's not the same, but I think you kind of answered that question. So we have, for example, in our uh, dashboard in the results section that you we have this disease prediction, which is not disease risk. Is that what you mean? Um, uh, yes. Uh, when we speak about risk, for example, in genetics, like you have a risk of, uh, I don't know, arteriosclerosis. Uh, that uh, that we can speak of a risk in this case because we know that the genetics are first. Yes, uh, we we are born without genetics and uh, uh, not with the disease. So the genetics might cause uh, some risk uh, for um, uh, some disease. With the microbiome, it's not the same. Uh, mm -hmm. We uh, lack uh, the uh, longitudinal studies, for example, when we uh, see microbiome of a human throughout of his life uh, and watch, uh -huh, he, uh, in this moment of life, uh, he had this microbiome, then he got this illness, and his microbiome changed after that. Yes, most studies uh, we uh, see just the uh, well, the subject uh, already has uh, some kind of illness, and we uh, have uh, uh, his or her microbiome in this particular moment, not before, not after, uh, and that is why we cannot say what was the cause. Mm -hmm. uh, did illness change uh, the microbiome, or was uh, the microbiome reason for a disease? And it's probably actually two, two, two ways, so both ways. So it's the microbiome can affect, maybe in, yeah, impact the risk, and, and the vice versa. Uh, but it's very hard to distinguish how much each of these influenced uh, or influencing uh, the disease, I guess. Mm -hmm. Uh, too many variables, uh, too, too complicated systems. So that is why we, we can see we can say only uh, like you like uh, you look like a, uh, a subject with uh, uh, such illness uh, to some extent, like for eighty percent. Yes, that uh, that is what we can say. 
but I would rather avoid uh, calling it a risk. Yeah. So in simple words, we can observe correlation, association, but not causation. Yes, exactly. essentially, uh, which is one of the first things we learn in science. Correlation does not imply causation. <laughs> uh, okay, cool. Um, I think that's really all questions for me. I mean, it was really interesting. Is there anything maybe you want to add um, kind of for our listeners in terms of maybe what the future holds and what do we, I mean, you kind of outlined the limitations already, um, but is there anything else that you think is worth mentioning and pointing out? Uh, I think I, I would add a couple of words on um, bacteria food connection. Yes, uh, the main thing we use in our Atlas uh, Biomed test, microbiome test. Uh, well, to, uh, well, right now, uh, this knowledge is uh, much limited, uh, like uh, which uh, bacteria uh, likes uh, which kind of food. And this is uh, quite an applicable and uh, quite an important question. Uh, what we do is we just gather this uh, information uh, throughout uh, like millions of articles um, uh, done on also animals, uh, mice, pigs, uh, and uh, very few studies on humans. Mm. And uh, to my mind, uh, the future is uh, about uh, getting more information of how exactly each product, each uh, ingredient, each food item uh, affects a particular uh, bacteria uh, presence. Uh, mm -hmm. That's uh, something we should focus on. And it's definitely, I can confirm this um, uh, sort of question and demand from uh, practical standpoint. So a lot of our users, they often ask, okay, if I don't have or have very little of particular bacteria, what exactly can I eat or not eat to influence this bacteria, to increase it or decrease it if it's uh, maybe uh, an opportunistic pathogen. But the problem is, yes, we don't have that precise data. Uh, only for a few bacteria we have, um, right? So, um, yeah, it's, a, it's kind of a challenge, but uh, I think with the speed of science that we have developing now, I hope that we're gonna slowly, slowly, or not so slowly, learn um, yeah, which foods uh, have significant impact on, on which particular bacteria, or at least groups of bacteria. Like for example, yeah, butyrate producing bacteria or other short chain fatty acids. Mm -hmm. Great, I think uh, we can wrap it up here. Um, I mean, it was really fascinating. I, I'm just fascinated by the bioinformatics and I, I wish I, I knew more in terms of all this, you know, machine learning and maybe the future is a project for me. Um, but uh, for now, we have amazing uh, brains like yourselves in our team, um, which really make this all uh, possible and real. And uh, thank you very much for giving us this amazing lecture. And um, I think maybe it would be good to have a, like a follow up maybe later on, something like that, when we have new data and new information. Um, to have you back and, and share your amazing knowledge and expertise. Uh, sure, thank you, Lisa. Thank you very much. Yeah. To be here. Okay, see you soon. Bye bye.